there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, this is uh, my presentation. Um, <laughs> surrealism and the occult. I've had a lifelong uh, interest in the occult, or into in, in kind of esotericism, really, rather than a, uh, anything particularly dark and sinister. Um, so it's been really interesting to kind of explore um, the, the influences on, on surrealism from this particular area of interest. So basically the presentation is a bit of an introduction to what occultism is, what the influences are, contextualize it a little bit, and then explore a couple of pieces of art um, that are clearly, clearly influenced. And then, and then reveal a new discovery who you're probably really, really well aware of, but she's completely new to me, uh, and I love it. So, um, so hopefully, and end on that note. So basically, there exists both implicit and explicit relationships between surrealism and any form of kind of initiatory um, esoteric, esoteric and occult art. And the, the kind of schools of thought that we're drawing on with things like divination, astrology, dark romanticism, which I absolutely love, um, the Celtic world and Celtic mythology, alchemy, magic, voodoo, and Gnosticism, or uh, kind of looking for one's own self-awareness. <clears throat> so, a couple of quotes, first of all. Uh, La Tremont, or La Tremont, the science that I undertake is distinct from poetry. I do not sing about the latter. I force myself to discover its source. And then, obviously, a quote from Breton in the first of the Manifesto of Surrealism. For the time being, my intention has been to see that justice was done to the hatred of the marvellous which rages in certain men, the ridicule under which they would like to crush it. So I, I really like that because it's kind of that rage against the establishment that he's got and rage against kind of uh, the very, very con tight constraints of kind of bourgeois society. So the, it's a quite a dark photograph of the three, and particularly those on the, on the back row. You can just about make breath on, on the end of the back row or his nose anyway with a little bit of highlighter on. Um, with the front, we've got Man Ray, um, Art, Tango, Breton at the back, and Darley, Eldwards, Macburn, Chevelle, and Zara on the back row. So, as Breton stated in the 1924 Surrealist Manifesto, I believe in the future resolution of these two states outwardly so contradictory, which are dream and reality into a sort of absolute reality, a surreality. Yeah. And in many ways, this was a call to arms <coughs> from artists or to artists to draw inspiration from dreams and mythology and the unconscious, uniting the subjective and objective to art, embracing the modern while exploring the primitive and the irrational. I have to consider the, the kind of the cultural norms and the cultural climate of the time, which was in many ways very, very exciting. So the Surrealists sought inspiration from, from non-artistic courses, particularly kind of new um, disciplines of ethnology and psychology, as we heard last time from Zelda, and particularly Freudian theory, and the exploration of the unconscious, dream symbolism, and the central importance of sexuality. But they did like their sex. Okay. So the surrealists essentially sought the marvellous, an illumination of consciousness that transformed perception so that even the most mundane of objects would then yield strange and beautiful characteristics because you are perceiving them in a different way. So they were anti-establishment, but rather than, as Dada did, reject kind of Western culture wholesale. They wanted to, they were very, very drawn to the more primitive and perverse aspects, aspects of it, non-conformist. So it was pretty much no surprise <clears throat> that they were drawn to the occult or to esotericism. So I love this quote from Michel Lowry. Surrealism is not, never has been, and never will be a literary or artistic school <laughs> but is a movement of the human spirit 
in revolt and an eminently subversive attempt to re-enchant the world, an attempt to re-establish the enchanted dimensions at the core of human existence, poetry, passion, mad love, imagination, magic, myth, the marvelous, dreams, revolt, utopian ideals, which have been eradicated by this civilization and its values. What an awesome quote is that? Fantastic. That, that is brilliant. <laughs> Great quote. Great quote. <clears throat> so what do we mean when we're talking about the occult or esoteric? So occult is from the Latin word occultus, which means hidden or clandestine secrets, and it's the knowledge of the hidden. In common English usage, it refers to knowledge of the paranormal as opposed to knowledge of the measurable or the objective, usually referred to as science. <clears throat> so the term occult sciences was used in the 16th century to refer to astrology, alchemy and natural magic. And in many ways, these evolved into astronomy, modern chemistry, psychology, into new sciences. <clears throat> but at the time, they were very, very much burgeoning things. So the term occultism emerged in 19th century France, where it came to be associated with various French esoteric groups connected to Eliphas Levine, paper, which were huge influences on, in, on surrealism itself, but perhaps also the kind of romanticism from before then. Esotericism, by contrast, can be described as a kind of a Western form of spirituality that is very much focused on individual efforts to gain spiritual knowledge or gnosis, where, <clears throat> where a man's confronted with the divine aspects of existence, as opposed to uh, a belief in a kind of a monotheistic religion. So it's very much around personal development, personal spirituality, as opposed to that kind of religious um, connotation. So there are some fairly common principles of occult thought. So that the universe is a single living substance. The universe is comprised of complementary and interactive opposites. Mind and matter are a unified entity. Everything that exists corresponds in universal analogy. So man a woman, but man and woman, for example, is a microcosm of the universe black, white. Imagination is a real motivating force that can act upon matter in a subtle way, which is kind of the principle around any kind of belief in magic that mind can shape or, or influence matter. And the self-realization, the esoteric principle, and thus realization of the nature of the universe can be achieved through a variety of methods such as intuition, illumination, medication, accidents, self-induced derangement <laughs> or experimentation, and an awful lot of kind of laudanum and hashish and, and different kind of uh, methods of, of changing one's uh, <laughs> consciousness and perception. I can explain But they're kind of some of the underpinning thoughts. So we know that in the surrealism was heavily influenced by the poetic theories of Baudelaire, Ambo, the Clermont, which in turn have been heavily influenced by the occult revival. So symbolist painting, for example, represented the move towards the more psychological and conceptual mode of art, rather than just the kind of a, a way of depicting an actuality, but not just simply re visual representation. So occultism was affected, affected by, but not of, either religion or science, was a really flexible and subjective system of thought that really existed outside of mainstream society and intellectual orthodoxy, and very, very much appealed to artists. And also at the time, well, um, you know, in the, in the early 20th century, late 19th century, Virgin and scientific discoveries almost seems like proof of occult doctrines, almost seems to give them credence, such as Heisenberg and Berkman. And the idea of an astral plane or fourth dimension was incredibly seductive. So the idea that the objective and subjective were not mutually exclusive. So surrealism benefited from this kind of rich mix of kind of intellectual uh, 
climate and a sense of freedom and possibility, so many doors were potentially opening. So we know that surrealism originated in Romanticism, which, were, which in itself was a reaction against that very rationalist and classical view of nature that was tarnished in many ways by kind of images of bloodshed and horror of the revolution, Napoleonic campaigns, for example. And then the philosophy of a Mar the Marquis de Sade, rooted in violence in a more nihilistic way, was much more appealing to the surrealists, who found it a much more authentic expression. So the rom romantic artists aimed to express the view of nature as a realm of the sublime, that it was beauty, but with tinge with that sense of, of reality, of horror, with terror, mystery, it's dark and irrational. So occultism was a really strong influence to this cultural climate. But the use of esoteric sources, for example, by the utopian socialists, Saint Simon and Fourier, for example, in their political discourses, they were really, really strong um, influence. We know that Breton was a learned man. He valued erudition. It was one of his guiding principles. And so, and, and that was true in the esoteric sources that he read and commented upon. It wasn't, no, he didn't kind of dance naked with witches around stone circles that we know of, but he very much read a lot around the occult um, and critiqued uh, lots of kind of occultish, lit occult literature. Um, and so he wasn't necessarily interested in the populist metaphysical, but very much in this long-standing and revered tradition going back centuries. <clears throat> so what are the occult influences on the Surrealists? Obviously, we've already said that they derived most of their knowledge of esotericism and cultism from books, and especially by either romantic and symbolist poets and novelists, or by an academic study of esotericists themselves. For example, Eliphas Levi, who was a, a former priest but also a, a magical theorist rather than somebody who indulged in a cult of themselves. It was a really strong moralistic poem. The poetry of Baudelaire and Rambo and the Tremont, um, but also far, far more ancient occult sources such as Hermes, Flamel the Alchemist, Agrippa, Agrippa, the Renaissance magician. So, they, they read very, very well. I mean, there were multitudes of, um, you know, of influences, including but for different surrealists as well, going back to uh, the White Goddess. Um, oh, gosh. Particularly Celtic mythology, particularly for Leonora Carrington, who we'll be looking at a bit later. I've got a really, really nice quote of... Uh, of Rambo, which isn't here, we just find it. A certain knowledge of the occult sciences, sciences is becoming necessary in order to understand a great number of present day literary works. Magic occupies a large place in the imagination of our poets and novelists, and they have been caught in the dizzy and full of the invisible, haunted by the idea of the unknown. You see how actually really quite seductive that is. That's um, a quote from Anna Telfon. Spiritual onimism, a soul exhausted by secret thoughts, insidious appeals to sacrilege and debauchery, goddesses riding hippogriffs and streaking their lapis lazuli wings, the death agony of the clouds. You can see how incredibly rich this kind of pool of, of, of kind of uh, imagery was for both poetry and art. So Breton in the Surrealist Manifesto said, the Surrealism is not just a new form of culture, but as a, a reevaluation of the past and an attempt to explore obscure and neglected aspects of human experiencing, transcending logic and rationalism. One of, his, one of the things he advocated was autonomy, oh, I can never say this, 
automatism, thought dictated in the absence of all external control or control by reason, and outside of other aesthetic moral preoccupations, borrowed from both the kind of free association of Freudian psychology, but also spiritualism, used more predominantly for literary work uh, and you know and, and novels than than necessarily painted art. I want to have a look at a few kind of uh, of the surrealists. We've talked a lot about Breton, so I'm going to leave him behind now uh, and talk about other surrealists who were heavily influenced by the by the occult. Seligman was quoted as saying in 1946 that magic philosophy teaches that the universe is one, that every phenomenon in the world of matter and of ideas obeys the one law which coordinates the all. And such doctrine sounds like a program for the painter. Is it not his task to shape into a perfect unity within his canvas the variety of depicted forms? And a, a, a year before one of Seligman's paintings, Sabbath Phantom Mythomania. This is a picture from the Aurora Convergence from the 14th century. Uh, it's, not, it's not the best depiction, to be honest with you. But then, of this men shall know nothing by Max Ernst. And the similarities in the two and the clear influences there. In many ways, Leonora Carrington um, was of the surrealists, the most widely perceived as having a particularly clear, or, have a particular, or showing a particularly clear example of art influenced by the occult. And most attempts at analyzing the esoteric elements of her work have focused on her literary production rather than her, uh, her painted art. Her writings contain multiple references, veiled or less veiled, to themes associated with esotericism or the occult and provide quite indispensable information about the development of her interest in these domains, particularly in her more autobiographical work, and particularly those that depict her descent into uh, the insanity following her forced separation from Ernst when the beginning of the war, the brutal rape she experienced at the hands of soldiers, and the subsequent descent into um, madness and insanity and the horrific treatments that she uh, she she experienced in, um, in, in mental facilities um, and later when she wrote about this it was, she talked quite explicitly around uh, the influence of the occult. She was also notoriously reluctant to discuss uh, or explain her patients, her paintings but her occult influences are clear in a couple of examples. Uh, obviously, this isn't a Carrington one. This is uh, from the Histoire de la Magie, History of Magic by Eliphas Levi. The magic head from the Zohar. And then Ed Eo Quad by Leonora Carrington. I'm having some light issues here. And the analysis of the elements of this painting make it, you know, quite clearly a drawn from kind of very, very steep kind of symbolism from occultism. As is uh, burning is Giordano Bruno, who's one of my, as an astronomer, one of my one of my he heroes. Um, again, lots and lots of occult symbology in her painting. And one of the many ways was the saddest picture of Ernst, which was clearly around the kind of the ending of his relationship with uh, with Carrington, both as his lover and his muse with the roving of the bride. And again, this draws heavily from a kind of more esoteric pool of uh, symbology into this painting. I know this has been discussed at length in, in, in previous Surreal Pool sessions. 
exactly. But the discovery I've made, <laughs> new to me, is Isol Colquhoun. She was active in the Surrealist movement. There was a contemporary of Dali in Breton, and her paintings are full of androgynous gods, murderous goddesses, the only like fruit, disembodied fleshy parts floating across hallucinatory dreamlike landscape. So she's quoted as saying, my life is uneventful, but I sometimes have an interesting dream, as which is somewhat understated explanation of her work. Her lifelong involvement with occult groups saw her almost ostracized from the movement, and her name has largely been omitted from art historical narratives. But the case has relatively recently acquired the archive of her work, um, and hopefully this will mark a pivotal step in recognizing her contributions to surrealism. And there is a link there to, to the archive that's uh, available online. And just to finish off, a couple of Colquhoun's uh, paintings. I absolutely love them. Gorgon from 1946. And Alcove from the same year. <laughs> 